Now this is going to be the roving bike, and Sally will rove it, and we're going to do a question from a woman, a question from a man, if we can. Okay. So, does anybody have a question? Or comments. Comments are nice. You said it wouldn't be a great idea if you had a national security strategy which addresses the real security issues. Is anybody doing that? Is that what you have in hand? <laughs> I'd love to tell you that I was halfway through doing it, but um, I can't remember the question. Oh yes, the national security strategy. I'm not aware that others are thinking of doing that, but I just thought it would be nice to show what it should look like, because there are different groups who've got different parts of the answer to that but I just liked the idea of bringing it together. So there actually was a parallel document that would then stimulate the debate about why the government's security strategy is, is so lacking in what's needed for the real threats that we face today. So I'm not aware that anybody is, but I would love it if someone got inspired to go and do such a thing, and I would be very happy to contribute to it. How do you keep cheerful? <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> Well, thank you for that. I mean, I think I keep cheerful because we've got the best people on our side. And that, that is always worth remembering. Um, and on a personal level, my, I, I am so blessed by my staff. Kath Miller, whom some of you may know, she's been with me 12 years now, I think, um, and knows me better than I know myself. So uh, just having some great people around you, I think, is what you need to keep hopeful. Thank you for covering so much ground. It was impressive. And thank you for mentioning Lucas Aerospace, because I think that it's one of the examples that we have of approaches which we really need to be encouraging at the moment, particularly when you look at nuclear decommissioning and think that there are scientists and technicians with specialist skills which could be turned towards waging peace and creating a new future. And I sort of look at other countries, you've mentioned Spain, there's fantastic stuff that goes on in Scandinavia. So my question to you is, how do we A, get the information, B, spread it, and C, use it to build the kind of coalitions that we need for that kind of program? I don't have all the answers to that, but I do think that the, uh, the trade unions are key to it. Um, and, you know, uh, a, a number of the, the trade unions are working closely with the climate movement, which I find one of the most inspiring sort of collaborations. And, you know, they use the, the term just transition, but they're fleshing out what that actually means in practice. What I would love is whether or not some unions could uh, talk to some of their colleagues, because obviously the unions for staff who work in the nuclear industry um, are not yet on board with this agenda. And I kind of feel that they're more likely to listen to their colleagues in other unions and have that debate than perhaps they would to you know, people who are perceived to be from the outside who, who maybe don't understand some of the pressures that they're under. So it seems to me that the trade union here do have a, a massive opportunity and a, and a massive role to play. And the ones who are already on board are doing fantastic work. I think the challenge is to see whether they would be prepared to have more of a conversation with their colleagues and, and just find some tangible examples. Because I always feel that when we talk about a just transition and we say, yes, of course, we'll make sure that people are trained up in other skills that are equally as valued by society and paid well and so forth. It's an easy thing to say, but it's a harder thing to deliver. And so if we could have a few more pilot projects, if you like, some things to demonstrate, just as this example of Spain has, that it isn't just words, it is something real, tangible, then I think we'd have a better chance because I do understand you know, if someone comes along to you and basically says, you know, I want your job to go away, that's pretty threatening. And you're, you know, you, you don't listen at that point. You just think that's my job, that's my livelihood, that's my kids, and that's understandable. So somehow we need to have that conversation in a way that's not threatening and, might, and that is based on real tangible evidence that this can be done. 
Uh, Caroline, thank you very much. My name is Christine Lara, uh, Vice President for the Movement of Revolution and War, but I'm also the Chair of Trustees of the Nuclear Education Trust, and I commend to this audience the recent report that the NET has done on uh, defence diversification. Uh, and I do think that UNITE has taken a very good, UNITE the Union, has taken a very good position, and as you say, others less so, the trade unions are working on our colleagues, and I'm certainly doing that myself. However, my question to you is about education, because uh, you spoke very warmly about all of us in this room and our allies beyond this room, but the really important issue for me is how we get some of this some of these really important ideas into the curriculum and you will know and the Green Party knows very well that at the moment the school curriculum is a straitjacket. It's not a vehicle for encouraging creative thinking, encouraging problem solving. Um, and so I just wondered if you'd like to say something about how you see the role of education in terms of our future. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for, I should have named Unite, they're doing, they're doing some great uh, work on this, as others are. Um, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. It, it, it scares me that we've got a generation of young people growing up who have no understanding, for example, about the nuclear threat. I mean, I'm not suggesting we scare the life out of them, but just to let them know what's out there. And, and most of them don't. I mean, it's just nowhere in the curriculum. Um, and, and also the positive examples of, of, of peace building are nowhere there either. So in history, they're learning you know, how you wage war pretty well, but they're not learning all of those examples of how you do the alternative. So I couldn't agree with you more when it comes to trying to ensure that young people do get a much broader education. And you'll know that it's, it's a really hard time to be saying that because our curriculum is getting narrower and narrower, it feels, by the, by the moment. I mean, I guess in the meantime, um, I mean, it worries me too that we need younger people as part of our movement and we need to be making the connections between our movement and the environment movement and the movements that young people right now are perhaps more drawn to. Um, and so maybe there are ways in youth centres, to the extent they still exist, um, and, and other opportunities to, to be having that connection between these different campaigns so people can learn more about it and understand more about it. In terms of what I'm doing, just to give one example, um, I'm working with a, a wonderful woman called Mary Colwell, who uh, is a nature writer and broadcaster. Um, and she had the idea a few years ago of a GCSE in natural history. And by that, she means not just another biology exam, but something that would be about really getting young people out into nature and appreciating it, you know, in the way that I saw a statistic the other day that our young people spend less time outside than the average prisoner, <laughs> which is a fairly scary thought. I don't know what that was quite based on, but anyway. But we do have a generation of young people who spend less time outside than ever before. And at the same time, not necessarily directly linked, but I don't think it's an entire coincidence. We also have a generation of young people who have quite a lot of mental health issues as well. So a GCSE in natural history would be a way of making space in the curriculum, at least for people to understand nature, to know it. I was really struck by something a wonderful writer called Richard Louvre said, a US writer. He said, people won't protect what they don't love and they won't love what they don't know. And if that's true, then we need to make sure that young people are knowing more about the trees and the flowers and the birds and everything around us, and not just in a narrow scientific way, but in a holistic way. So Mary and I went to see Michael Gove the other day, and we sat down in his deep white sofas, which was quite an odd situation. Um, but what he told us, he was, it didn't hurt him to say he was sympathetic, he did sound broadly sympathetic, but he also said that actually the, the trick is to talk to the exam boards, as you probably know, but I hadn't realised quite how independent the exam boards are. They can, they can come up with a new curriculum and as long as you know, they've got schools who are interested in it, that can happen. It doesn't need the blessing of the Department for Education. And I hadn't realised that. And that to me is a bit of an opportunity. So our next job is to go and meet some of the people who have some of the big exam boards. And if I'm successful on nature, then I'll start peace studies straight away afterwards, I promise. <laughs> Caroline, I hope that spirit speech can be published, please. Active remembrance, 
and waiting peace by the EU are both admirable qualities. And it is greatly to our discredit that they are now preparing to leave the EU. <laughs> My question is this, how do you see the United Kingdom's place in the world assuming that Brexit does go through. How do you see our place politically compared with the political place we have at present? I'm afraid I can only say that I, I would see it as a diminution of our influence. And one of the ironies is actually that quite a lot of the things that the EU does are things that the UK persuaded it to do, the, the good things. You know, the reason that the EU has pretty good climate policy is partly down to the UK and our influence there. Um, so it just feels an enormous loss of influence. It feels an, a, a greater dependence on the United States at a time when that's quite a scary prospect. I worry for our social and environmental standards, our animal welfare standards, because we know that Theresa May wants to be able to, uh, to conclude a trade deal with the US very quickly to try to show the success of her post-Brexit strategy. And yet we also know that Trump has absolutely no interest in social and environmental standards and that he believes they are just a, a, a barrier to trade. So I'm afraid, at the moment at least, I do see us as being a diminished country on the world stage. I think our influence will be much less. I think it will be harder to defend what I hope are our values when it comes to social and environmental concerns. Um, I'm struggling to see much of an upside. Uh, you know, the Commonwealth is there, but I, I don't see that our membership of the EU takes away from our membership and, and work with Commonwealth countries, that the two are entirely compatible. So I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to um, not find anything very hopeful about that particular scenario, I'm afraid. You have a really wonderful resilience, I hope, <laughs> I think. Um, I wanted to ask, and I've been meaning to ask a politician, um, how do you feel about our democracy at the moment? And how does uh, cross-party work uh, in the House of Parliament? How does it work for you? So the second bit first, how does it actually work in practice in the House of Commons? I mean, the good news is that it's not quite as much of a bear pit as it looks on, on PMQs. And that there is scope to work cross-party on quite a lot of issues. And that there are things called these all-party parliamentary groups and I'm uh, chair of, of, of a CND one, and there's others on everything from climate change to education to beer to Burma to, you know, there's, there's a million of them. And they are opportunities for people to work together cross party. So it happens more than I thought it might. So that was one of the positive aspects of, of discovering that people are willing to make common cause across, across the different political parties. And I can think of issues that I've worked with members of just about every party on. I mean, even with the Conservatives, there were some, uh, I say even, sorry, but anyway, even with the Conservatives, there were um, some, some uh, colleagues who, who are not bad when it comes to forestry, for example, or uh, when it came to um, trying to press for the, for the EU referendum. No, it wasn't that one, sorry. It was the, it was the, um, it was the uh, alternative vote, when we had a referendum on the alternative vote then, um, then uh, I've just forgotten his name now. Oh God. Who was the man who was a conservative and briefly joined UKIP and then lost his seat? Carswell, thank you, Douglas Carswell. So uh, I, I, he's not someone I would have much in common with, but we worked together, Douglas Carswell and I, to try to get the option of, of a genuinely proportional system on the ballot paper when we were voting around the alternative vote. So the good news is it's more possible to work cross party. The bad news is that it, your first question, what, what is the state of our democracy today? I think it's appalling. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I've got a special pleading, I guess, but the lack of, of, of first past, you know, the lack of a proportional system, the fact that we've got first past the post. 
means that people's voices simply aren't heard. So at the last election, 68% of votes cast didn't actually have a material effect to any outcome. So basically they were piling up in constituencies where already enough votes have been cast for the person who, who won the seat. And so what that breeds is that it's a system where people don't feel they can make much of a difference. They think that the same party will hold the same seat for year after year if they're in safe seats. It means that election campaigns are fought really just over the marginal seats where not so many people live. And on a personal basis, it means that the one million people who voted green in 2015 didn't get the 20 MPs that a proportional system ought to have delivered. They just got one and I'm tired. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, there are really good reasons to try to, uh, to shift our electoral system. I'd love to pay tribute to a wonderful organization called Make Votes Matter. You might know of them, but they're doing great work, uh, in particular, actually, right now with local Labour parties, trying to get local Labour parties to put pressure on the Labour leadership to change its position. And I've had a conversation with, with Jeremy about this and, um, and with John McDonnell. And John McDonnell supports, he's an active supporter, he says, of electoral reform, so that's good. Jeremy said, um, he wants to make sure that it's a system that keeps the constituency link. Well, that can be done. There are lots of proportional systems whereby you still have a, a constituency MP, albeit for a slightly larger constituency. But what he did say was that it's not an issue that is ever raised with him. So if there are Labour Party members in this room, please, when he's at his next rally or when you next get an opportunity at your local Labour Party, please raise it. Because I honestly think that you cannot be for the many, not the few, if you don't give the many a voice through a change in our voting system. Hi Caroline, you love your speech, thank you very much. Um, so, looking at how lots of developing countries are growing, but with investment on more fossil fuel based investments like, um, like China's Belt and Road Initiative, like we're in Pakistan, there's more funding there, there are more jobs there, but there's a push on like increase of coal mines and things like that. Do you think we as a, we as Britain could this like move a bit of our money and actually put it into investing into renewable energies in other countries and do things like Spain have done and invest in renewable energies, invest in areas invest in jobs to develop those countries more effectively but helping the countries themselves and the environment around it. That's a brilliant question, thank you very much. The first thing we could do is to stop using our development budget to fund fossil fuel development in some of those poorer countries. That's what we're doing, obviously not in China, but in other developing countries. Our aid money is going to help fossil fuel development. How perverse is that? So certainly what we should be doing is helping those countries to kind of leapfrog over the worst industrial processes that we've been through so that they can get to green energy and industrial solutions much quicker. And we have a responsibility, I think, to put up the resources to enable them to do that. And you'll probably know that's one of the big debates that happen at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, uh, discussions. Um, the, the conference of the parties and so on. There's a, there was a Paris climate agreement and there's going to be um, another um, meeting in, in uh, November, December coming up of all the different countries that are part of that climate agreement. And one of the stickiest subjects there is about whether the richer countries will put enough money on the table to enable the poorer countries to make a transition. So I think, you know, as much pressure that we can bring to bear on our government to play a positive role at that point is really important. And I think it's interesting with countries like China, you know, it's quite often said that, you know, why should the UK bother to try to shift in a greener direction when China is building a new coal fire power station, you know, every week or something. But actually, even in China right now, they are shifting in a more green direction. Actually, lots of it because of air pollution and the, um, the number of, of, of local demonstrations and, and, and local people across China rising up and, and, and really putting pressure on their government because in so many places they just simply can't breathe the air at all because it's so polluted. So China is actually making um, quite big strides when it comes to renewable energy 
And the thing about China when it decides to make a decision like that is that it shifts everything because it's such a big country and it's, you know, I'm not suggesting that you go back to a command and control economy, but in these circumstances there is a silver lining in the sense that it does mean that when they do the right thing, the ripple effects of them doing that is massive. So when they decided, for example, to go for, um, for energy efficient light bulbs, you know, the market for that was just huge because you had such a, a, a huge number of people affected by it. So I think there are some really positive things happening, even in places that we sometimes think of as being the laggards. But certainly we could do a huge amount more, both in terms of our influence on the world stage, but also crucially with our development budget, in order to be able to help the good things rather than to be funding the bad ones. Thank you, Laura. You didn't mention well, the EC, but I agree with the state myself, the British Commonwealth, or the idea of the Commonwealth. Uh, do you think that's as a role to play in peacekeeping. I'd be interested in your comments on that. So you're going to get very fit here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So the question is about the Commonwealth and what role the Commonwealth has in building peace. And yeah, I'm sure it does. And I would love to see maybe a greater equality between the countries around the table at the Commonwealth, it still feels a little bit as if they are the ex-colonies and we are the, the mother country and I think that, that obviously needs to change. It is changing but it could change a bit faster perhaps. But certainly I think any of those groups when you've got countries that have come together for almost whatever reason, um, if we could make sure that peace building was higher up the agenda there, it means that we would have more influence and already what's happening with the Commonwealth is that environmental issues are rising up that agenda and I'm very pleased to see that actually the UK did play a positive role in terms of uh, having an agreement coming out of the Commonwealth when it comes to uh, dealing with oceans, with forests and so forth. Um, and to see how we could use that forum as a, as a, as a greater opportunity for, for peace building as well I think would be very good. I have to confess I, I don't know in detail what's happening there now so if there's someone who knows a lot more about it in the in the room would like to say, maybe you, maybe you yourself know more about it, but it feels to me that whenever we've got those groupings, we should be using whatever tools, whatever opportunities that we have, because this is an issue that needs to be at the top of the agenda, of the agenda whenever countries are coming together. Thank you very much for the speech, it's lovely. And a couple of things. One was, given the influence of lobbying and you know, the, the really concrete money that is being Spent the real sense of power, especially taking into account the uh, latest question about democracy and the lack of sort of minister of responsibility at the moment and lack of accountability. How do you counter that at the moment if you have no power in that realm? Thank you very much. That's a really good question about the power of the of the lobbyists, and it is massive, as you suggest, and. I remember where I, when I was first elected, I put down some um, freedom of information questions about how many um, members of the fossil fuel companies were actually working inside our department for energy at the time. And I can't actually remember the figure now, but it was like 20 or more, you know, it was, it was a significant figure. And what was interesting to me about that was, it was almost like they weren't even bothering to lobby, they were just going to get secondments directly into Whitehall and just write the stuff themselves, you know, cut out the middle person and just write the legislation themselves. And that's really scary and, it's, and, and you know, the government would, would um, justify it by saying that they need experts to help them craft legislation that is, you know, business friendly. Um, but they don't have people from the environmental organisations in anything like those numbers. You might have the odd one who might be seconded, but you don't have people from other expertise, you know, from, from the perspective of, for example, trying to protect nature. They don't have lots of those people in those ministries. So somehow we need to just make it visible and call it out. And that doesn't feel like a very powerful thing to do, but it, it feels like at the very least we can shine a spotlight on, on when it is happening. So we can try and demonstrate where you've got legislation that is literally being written by the people that it's going to regulate. So, so if you've got the person who is going to be regulated, writing the regulation, then that's already a massive conflict of interest and somehow that needs to be more exposed. And when it came to more traditional lobbying, of course, there was the transparency and lobbying bill that then became the act. And 
Anyone who's involved with 38 Degrees will know that there was a major big 38 Degree campaign around trying to get that Lobbying and Transparency Act to have real teeth. Um, and, and instead of that, what's happened is that it got so watered down that what it has done is meant that the NGOs like Friends of the Earth and others are much more nervous about criticising government because it kind of circumscribes what the NGOs can do because they're not allowed to be small p political. And, you know, almost anything is political by the end of the day. Um, but, but, but what it hasn't done is to properly regulate those companies it was meant to regulate. So uh, it will regulate companies that are just made up of, corporate, of, of lobbyists, but it won't regulate the, um, the, the, the lobbyists who work inside BP or Shell or whatever. So there's a massive loophole there. So what we can try and do is to make that, that piece of legislation stronger, and there will be a review clause in it. I can't remember when it is, but we, we need to use the opportunity to try to strengthen it. But it is, I would love to have a better answer for you because it is, it's a real poison in our political system. And obviously not just in ours, but in the US and elsewhere as well. And most of it is hidden. So you don't actually even know the fact that, you know, food standards are quite often being drawn up by businesses that have an interest in making sure that those standards aren't the strongest that they could be. And, and it's toxic, it is. Caroline, you, you um, had a letter in The Guardian. I think it was also your co-signatures included Naomi Klein and maybe a couple of environmental um, organisations. But the headline was about the need for rationing. And I see that as so counter to the sort of capitalistic system we exist under. And uh, politics is supposed to be the, the art of the possible. I'd like you to sort of enlarge on how you think that can be achieved because it seems so, so essential actually to have a future. You talked about 80% of uh, fossil fuels remaining in the ground. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think this was a, it was a, a letter that was put together by um, Andrew Sims, who um, used to work at the New Economics Foundation. Um, and basically, he was looking at the non-proliferation treaty, I think, and trying to find some connection with, with how, you could, how you could try to learn the lessons of of, um, of what treaties have been effective when it comes to trying to get people to change behaviour. So I'm trying to remember which letter it was, to be very honest, because I've had several in the paper just recently. But um, maybe I'll just talk about rationing rather than the letter, because I can't exactly remember what the letter was. Um, I, I think the word rationing is a difficult one for the reasons that you describe, because um, no one likes to think they can't have exactly what they want and as much of what they want as they need. And that's why you need a framework. And I suppose it does come back to what I mentioned briefly around contraction and convergence, which is this idea that we need to somehow build justice into our, into our global system. And that means recognizing that there will be less throughput of consumption and production in the, in the richer countries to give more space to allow the poorer countries to to be able to develop and, and to be able to get to a you know a, 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 an unequal degree of, of 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 production and consumption and how you do that i think you can the only way you can do that is by coming back to what i tried to describe at the end in a way which was around making the case that i think is true that there is a trick in here that is about making our lives better too that that you know you can't imagine people marching through the streets with placards saying what do we want less when do we want it now you know people 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 always want more of something but if what we could be saying that they might get more of would be greater well-being or, or, or less anxiety, or more time with their friends and family, as long as you've got the basic needs covered, because I appreciate that message to someone who can't put food on the table is patronising and naive. But once those basic needs are met, then if we can spend more time talking about those things that we know matter to most people, you know, most people, on their deathbeds don't look back on their lives and think you know my god i wish i bought that extra dress from the shop or that i'd spent more time in the office they they think about the things that we know matter to people more which are about relationships and are about what we do with our very very short time on this planet and that sounds very worthy and we need to get the experts the advertisers and others who know how to sell ideas to get better at 
at, at selling that message, if you like. So I'm certainly not suggesting that we go out there and, and try and persuade people on the doorsteps that what they need is, is less. But I think if we had a message that was about talking about the levels of, of mental ill health in our country, talking about the levels of anxiety, talking about the fact that, you know, as the New Economics Foundation always proves so beautifully that our GDP may well have doubled or trebled over the last 20 or 30 years, but our levels of well-being have not. They have either remained stubbornly the same or on some indicators they've come down. You know, the ability of thinking that your kids are going to have clean air to be able to breathe or, um, you know, to, to, to have just the, the basics that, that we've taken for, for granted. So there's got to be a positive message in there and, and, it, and it's got to be something that we get better at finding a way of describing so that it's something that people can tangibly feel and imagine and invest in. Sorry, that was a long way around of getting there, getting tired. I think this is going to be uh, the last question. <coughs> and it's going to go to a, a, a woman, so. <laughs> yes, thank you, Caroline, for a very moving and inspiring talk. Have you got a message for the movement for the abolition of war, a simple one that we can take and try to put into practice. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, throughout the speech, I was giving some little messages um, and, and some takeaway things which I hoped people would, would pick up. And so, I think the biggest message, to be honest, is, is to keep having conversations, particularly with people who don't agree with you, um, because we're all too good at having conversations with people that we do agree with, and it's much more comfortable to have those conversations. But I think it's striking up the conversations with people who don't agree with us on nuclear weapons or on Brexit or on, um, you know, on, 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 on the position of, of, of the UK in the world. And just to begin to have those conversations, because it feels like right now we are in our different trenches more than ever. And it's a truism to say that the country is more divided than ever before, but in many ways it is very divided. And if we can just have some of those conversations in an unthreatening way and just try to understand what makes other people come to the different conclusions they come to, then I think we might have a better chance of being able to um, find solutions that are in all of our interests. And I think that's an individual thing to do, but as a, as a movement for the, uh, the, the, the movement for the abolition of war, I think somehow, I mean, it's wonderful to have some, some young people in the audience. Uh, it's, it's brilliant, but we need more. And I think what we can do to try to connect this movement up with some of the other movements that, that are connected to a set of symptoms that lead to conflict. So, you know, you might not immediately see the connections to broader environment movements or anti-fracking movements or refugee movements or whatever. But ultimately there are connections and I always just feel that if we could only find ways of working more closely together, um, then the net impact of what we do would be even greater and maybe we might have a chance of getting done what needs to be done in the time left available to do it. Thank you, Caroline. And that has had a good, that's been a good thing in a way. A couple of years ago, we asked Caroline, could you come do the Remembrance Lecture? And she said, yes, it was 2016, if I'm not elected by then. But of course she was re-elected, <laughs> so she couldn't come. When the IWM said, sorry, but we're terribly busy this year, um, we can't have you, we thought, well, okay, there's other things going on. And we'd say, we'll move the day. And so we can have Caroline because this isn't Remembrance Sunday. And thank you very much indeed for coming. It's been great.